week with me, Susie Pettit, your certified life and wellness coach. And today I have a special guest for us. I have Catherine Winch, and she actually is the only second time guest so far in the show, a second time interview for us on the Love Your Life show. So we brought her back because I have heard from a lot of you, you loved listening into our first conversation where we really dug into perfectionism and people pleasing. And I wanted her back because her book, Slay Like a Mother, was very popular, the whole idea of um, slaying our dragons. And I wanted her to back, back to talk a little more about um, our self-confidence and sort of expectations and how looking into the future may not be our best bet. <laughs> but welcome back, Catherine. Thanks for having me, Susie. Thank you very much for coming. This is wonderful. And um, could you tell us first, I will put show notes in there for the our first episode. Um, I'm sorry, I will put a link in our show notes to the first episode where we dive into your background and all the wonderful work you're doing supporting women around the world. But could you tell us a little more about the idea behind your book, specifically the dragon, and, and you're talking about slaying the dragon. Absolutely. So the, the premise behind Slay Like a Mother is that we all have the ability to slay what I refer to as our dragon of self-doubt, this negative self-talk that's always telling us that we're pathetic and everybody else is perfect. <laughs> um, and, you know, it follows women around for most of their lives, but I am living proof that dragons can be slayed and you can still deal with a lot of chaos in your life without having to also deal with the chaos inside of you of wanting to be better, do better, do more, etc. So it's all about slaying your self-doubt. Yeah, that really is wonderful. And it, it, it resonated with me. Exactly. I mean, so much of your book I was reading, you know, I've highlighted so many of the comments that you had and um, just even I, I talk to my listeners as if we're warriors. I have a um, tattoo of warrior here. And on your first, the insert of your hardcover, it says it's time to shift from warrior to warrior with the O to the A. Um, and right there, I was like, well, I have to get this book. So, <laughs> which is really, um, which is really helpful. Could you tell us a little about how thinking about the future and getting into, um, I call it future casting, but how that sometimes feeds our dragon instead of slaying our dragon? Yeah, absolutely. So according to my research, you know, we spend more time worrying and fretting about the future than we do about the past. I think when most people talk about you know living in the present moment it's often positioned as don't relive your past but I find with women and mothers in particular the problem isn't the past most of us are well aware that we can't go back and you know change who we dated in high school or you know get better grades or whatever it is um, but we worry about the future and one of my friends calls this, calls it catastrophizing of because what we do as mothers is we fast forward to a very doomsday future. And it happens in a nanosecond. So you can be helping, you know, a young child study for a math test. You see they're kind of falling short on the topic. And immediately in your mind, you're pr picturing them at 17 years old, in prison, addicted to drugs. You know, they're never going to move out of your house. And um, men are less likely to do this. You know, if a child comes home, with the C on their report, a lot of men stereotyping here, but for the most part, a lot of dads are like, it's okay, do better next time. Mm -hmm. Where moms are already like, they're not gonna get into college. You know, it's this fast forwarding um, to the disaster zone that is ahead, which is obviously not healthy. Well, and that's interesting because I see it in, in motherhood for sure, or parenthood, that idea like your daughter talks back to you and you immediately, you know, future cast or, or catastrophize that, oh my gosh, I've raised this disrespectful child and she's going to be rude and all I'm once for life. But also just as a, a woman, I, I see it, you know, that if I make a mistake or something in an email or I, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, now I'm going to get fired or now, um, you know, everyone or whatever. Do you see that also in sort of the workplace or have you? Yeah. 
and it's it's very extreme. I'm glad you use that example because it's it's how I used to feel too when I grew up in the marketing and advertising world. And um, I would fear being fired. And it was like, okay, if we're working on a client project and the client doesn't like what we do, I'm gonna lose my job, or we're gonna lose this account, and a hundred people are gonna lose their job, and it's all gonna be my fault. And what that causes us to do as women is to overperform and overwork out of fear of a situation that is highly unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. And so then say, oh, of course I can do the conference call at 10 o'clock at night that's in Asia. You know, of course I can do this. Of course I can be there because we're so terrified of the worst happening. But there's actually been a lot of psychological studies on this topic. And researchers have found that 80% of the time, and maybe 85% of the time, that we catastrophize something in the future, that it's not going to happen. Mm. And the 15% of the time that something does happen that's an adverse reaction, it's not as bad as what we predicted. Something okay. bad might happen, but it's not as extreme. So we have to be careful about exaggerating, you know, like this is going to be the worst thing, mm -hmm. you know, that, that happens because it's such wasted energy to work overtime to combat a problem that's not going to happen. Yeah, so why do you think we do that? Like the I think fear failure. I mean, when we have a dragon of self-doubt, we're terrified of failure. And so we want to be successful at everything. We want to be seen as successful at everything. And, you know, your dragon of self-doubt is often born during negative circumstances in your life. It's often when a woman is um, during or before adolescence. So you know, your first love broke your heart, somebody made fun of you in the third grade because you couldn't pronounce a word correctly, what it could become from abuse and neglect. And so for many of us, we know what failure feels like. We know what feeling abandoned feels like. We know what conditional love feels like. And we're so scared of going back to that place and being hurt all over again, that we try with all of our might and all of our time and all of our energy to, to prevent, mm. you know, anything bad from ever happening. Right. Again, but I'll give you an example that I share in the book, which is an example of when it doesn't come to fruition. This is a silly example, but I think it happens in most of our daily lives. So many years ago, I played on a tennis team and I was late for my match. I knew I didn't leave the house in enough time. It was 18 minutes away from my home. And those 18 minutes, I just berated myself in the car. You know, damn it, Catherine, you know, everybody else can leave on time. Why can't you? You're going to let everybody down. You're going to get disqualified. I mean, it was 18 hours of literally abuse. Oh, yeah. When I got there, I'm sweaty and I'm like oh my god I'm so sorry I'm like such a mess and my captain says oh don't worry that the match before is running way behind we're not going to start for another 25 minutes and I was like huh <laughs> you know like, and so you know your soul does hear what you say to yourself and when you yell at yourself for 18 minutes straight over something that never happened yeah then it's just useless, you know, energy. And even if I had been disqualified, you know what? The world keeps spinning, even if you get disqualified from a tennis tournament, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah, so just think about, and I invite your listeners to think about, how many times have you really fretted and worried and stressed about something that did not end up coming true? Well, I really like that. And earlier you said, like, such a waste of mental energy. And that's the piece that is has brought to focus my life, just the things that I used to worry about and also the thing, the things that I used to worry about that didn't come to fruition, whether it was, you know, something like, oh, what if my son doesn't make that team or what if I don't get that lead or what if, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then also just about the old, the whole mental energy of berating ourselves, that mental energy. Yeah. Where we could be spending yeah. that differently. Um, yeah, so it does stick to you, and it and it's a sign of you know how you feel about yourself. And you know, while 
the, the tennis example, you know, might seem silly, but at the same time, it's like, I need to go through experiences as a human being where I fail and I do show up eight minutes late and I do get disqualified and I have to love myself through that. I have to say, it's okay that you made a mistake. It's okay that you left late. It's okay. You know, like I don't have to do everything perfect. And I think that's a big part of my message with Slay Like a Mother is can you give yourself some grace when you make a mistake? And, um, and of course that's the definition of self-compassion, but I certainly didn't do that for the majority of my life. Yeah. So how do you start with that? How do you start, um, being kinder to yourself or giving yourself that grace? Well, one of the things that um, I talk about is, you know, and you can even do this with your children, you know, over dinner time or something. Certainly we have a lot more time with our families these days. <laughs> You know, and, and it's a simple question of what is the one mistake that you learned the most from today? Mm. And have everybody go around and share. And I did this with my son um, a couple years ago. And it was interesting how he, he kept saying the same thing multiple nights in a row. And he would say, the mistake I made today was I didn't get out of bed quick enough. And I was really rushed, you know, getting ready for school. And lo and behold, after he said that three days in a row, kind of admitted it and saying it out loud, by the fourth day, he was kind of self-correcting. Um, and so that's, that's one thing is as parents, we have to be able to talk to our children about our mistakes, about their mistakes, about other people's mistakes, so that it can humanize that. And, you know, so many people today grow up in households where perfection is expected Mm -hmm. and, and the tough times are never discussed. So the more you can admit your mistakes, the more you can forgive yourself for them. And that's the key to self-compassion. Well, I really like that. And just the idea of bringing some levity to it or almost humor, like, let me tell you what I did today or this, but that was not a piece of my household growing up. It was very much a, you know, we only want to hear about the perfect Susie and the good examples and all that and and to bring that into our houses now and then even into our own self-dialogue of of imperfect action um or just doing it messy you know moving forward not yeah. another thing that that you can do is especially in these times is you know in your journal or even on a post-it note write down three things that are new in your life right now to you and so it could be, you know, I'm now working from home or I'm homeschooling my children or, you know, it's new to me to not be able to care for my parents or be able to go see them. Or um, it could be a breast cancer diagnosis. It could be anything. But the point is, if you put that post-it note somewhere of the three things that are new to you in your life right now, those areas, if you start to see it in your own handwriting, you will be more likely to give yourself grace when you make a mistake. Because if you write down, I have never homeschooled my children before, uh, okay. then mistake, and you yell at your daughter, you know, for not finishing something on time or whatever it is, then mentally you can remind yourself, oh, I'm agitated because I don't know how to do this. I've never uh -huh. done this before. And when we don't do this exercise and we just dive into a lot of newness in our life without stopping and pausing and admitting that it's new, mm -hmm. then we just expect that we should be good at it because we're not admitting that it's new. And so then it's like, well, we should be nailing this. You yeah. Know, from the Why can't I do this with ease? And yeah. Oh, I really like that idea. I didn't, I hadn't thought of that before, but just the, it, again, it's giving yourself permission to just sort of do your best. And then, you know, the next day you can do 1% better because we don't know any better yet. Yeah. When I, I did this, when I was writing Slay Like a Mother, it's my first book and had never written a book before. And it, it was a big undertaking, obviously. And by the time I got on chapter nine or 10, I was like, come on, Catherine, this should be coming faster. You should be better at this. You're on chapter 10. And I caught myself in the act and I was like, no, 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 no. And so I wrote on a post-it note, I expect this to be hard. Mm. And I put it on my computer screen. And then every day that it was hard, I saw that post-it note and I was like, oh yeah, it's hard. Just like yeah. I thought. Instead of why am I not better at this? Why am I not faster at this? It's, it's the expectation that 
anything that you have never done before should be hard. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of a quote I highlighted in your book where it says you're talking about, um, you're in there, I don't know what chapter this is, but it's called You Set Superhero Expectations in a Mortal's World. And you say, um, suffering exists not because you're experiencing something hard, but because you refuse to admit that you're experiencing it at all. And there's a difference. Um, I see that a lot and I hear that a lot with almost the people will say, oh, these are first world problems. Like, so I shouldn't be upset about this or um, this shouldn't be that hard. Like just beating themselves up for the experience they're having. Yeah. There's a, a distinct difference between struggling and suffering. Okay. And struggling is brought on by the external circumstances in our life. You know, I'm trying to lose five pounds. I'm trying to get a healthy dinner on the table every night. I'm trying to maintain a relationship with my spouse, whatever it is. Those are all struggles. Everybody has them in some form. And, but suffering is when we dip down into this land of where our dragon of self-doubt lives and we yell at ourselves and annihilate ourselves for two different reasons. One, for having those struggles in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't have the struggle of my children not eating healthy food. They should just do it automatically. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't have the trouble of trying to figure out how to teach math. I should just know this. So we yell at ourselves for having the struggles in the first place or for not handling them better. You know, I should have solved this problem faster, I should have done this better. And while this next statement might sound overwhelming, it's really meant to be empowering. And the truth is that you are the cause of your own suffering. Mm. The struggles are external and the suffering is internal and it is brought on by yelling at yourself you know, all day. And if, if you're doing that, then you can learn to undo it. Mm -hmm. It's possible to not do that self and to do that to yourself anymore. And so my whole mission is to teach women around the world to struggle without suffering. Okay. And how do they start that? The first way to struggle without suffering is to teach the negative voice in your head some manners. Okay. And I'll give you a, a really recent example that is revealing too much about me, but it'll make the <laughs> point. We'll keep it between us. <laughs> you're never gonna you're never gonna get rid of the negative voice completely. So don't that shouldn't be your goal. The goal is to teach it some manners and train it to be nicer to you. So a couple weeks ago, I was on a business trip, and I really loved to ride the Peloton bike, mm -hmm. and I was staying in a hotel that had one, so I was super excited, got up, rode it, and at the end of my ride, I was kind of stretching my back, and I put my hands on the top side of my backside on both sides, and grabbed what I felt was two handfuls of cellulite, <laughs> and so the negative voice in my head immediately, without pause, said, oh my gosh, what must that look like? You know, and I'm like looking at, can everybody see it? And so that's what the voice said, oh my gosh, what must that look like? And I stopped it right then and there. And I said, no, 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 no. What this looks like is that I got my rear end out of bed and onto a bike. That's yeah. what it looks like period. Yeah. And so that's a great example of, you know, now that my dragon is dead and gone, I, old habits die hard. And mm -hmm. so it still pops up, but I can witness it. I can recognize it. And then I can immediately, you know, make it dissipate, you know, yeah. by the banners. I really like that. So being aware that it's there, first of all, not a truth, that it's just a voice in your head and you can just sort of catch it. And then be like, no, 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 not letting you in today. Um, you take that negativity out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's a practice. It's like yoga or it's like meditation. I mean, even I was doing a workout this morning and like the yoga instructor in her home, she just looked so fit and thin and, you know, nobody wears a shirt. They're all just like, you yeah, know, they're all perfect. And, now. and, you know, for a second I was like, damn, she looks so good. And, um, and then I just said, Yes, yeah, she does. Yeah. Like, why is that a reflection of me? That yeah. woman looks amazing and good for her, uh -huh. you know? And I'm not likely going to look like that, but I can still love myself. I can still love myself and recognize I'm not a yoga professional, so that's fine. You're like, it's, it's right. part of it. Yes. 
Like I like doing that too. So what I notice with myself in this inner voice is that I will catch it sooner in some areas. Like I have been working on my inner talk with my body and all that really since my teen years. And so I'm much quicker to catch that sort of voice that maybe touches that cellulite and is like, you know, okay, no voice, we're not doing that. You're fine here. Like those, that's your healthy butt or that's your, you know, that's your strong shoulders and that's how they look. But I still, in other areas of my life, it takes a little longer. Like maybe in business, I'll be like, oh, other people write a blog faster than you, Susie. <laughs> so I think it's just, it's interesting. And I just want to tell the listeners that that's normal. Like you, as you said, it doesn't go away. It's almost more like if you can catch it and be like, oh, there you are. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's right. And it's a good reminder that we are so multifaceted, you yeah. know, we're not just mothers, you know, workers, exercisers, you know, we're cooking, we're cleaning, I mean, we're just doing stuff. So there's so many areas that, that we need to, you know, maintain, you know, some sanity and not beat ourselves up. And, and one way that's helped me in the business world is um, I catch myself a little bit differently in the business world. And what I do is I just try to name the emotion that I'm feeling and therefore separate it from myself. So if I'm worried about the financials of the company, you know, are we going to make enough money? Can we keep everybody employed? What I will say to myself is, oh, look, there's fear. Uh, it is very neutral. It's like, oh, look, there's fear as if it's something else you know, and then as soon as I, sometimes I even say it out loud, um, but then it's like, oh, I've, I've named it, mm -hmm. you know, and now I know why my heart is racing, or I know why I'm snapping at, you know, my children, or, you know, somebody on the team, and so it, that can really be helpful, oh, look, there's frustration, oh, look, there's fatigue, oh, look, there's anger, oh, look, there's resentment, yeah. and so that can help the business world, too. That can help me a lot, just sort of detaching from it and almost, you know, doing like third person, like, oh, there's worry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, worry. I don't need you right now, but I see how, you know, or that fear is coming up and that's great. Um, you speak of using meditation or being in the now as a helpful tool to help with this catastrophizing. How does that help? Well, you know, it all, that topic can seem like a little loosey goosey to a lot of people, you know, of like living in the now and the present moment. It can be hard to kind of wrap your heads around, your head around. And so um, one of the things I use is just a mantra. When I find my mind fast forwarding, I say to like another time zone. So my body's in the present tense and my mind is in the future. Then, you know, I always say, I bring myself back by saying right here, right now. So let's say I'm, you know, helping my daughter study for something for school and then I'm getting worried about something she's doing or not doing and I'm catastrophizing to the future. I just say to myself, right here, right now. And then I remind myself I'm in my daughter's bedroom with her in this moment and that's all we have. You okay. know, I don't know what the future brings. And mm -hmm. so it's just it's just bringing that runaway train back home right here, right now. And sometimes, you know, even while I'm cooking dinner, I'll have to do it three times. Yeah. Because I'm thinking about my to-do list tomorrow. I'm thinking about when I can go to the grocery store. I'm thinking about coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And I just say right here, right now. And it, um, it can help you kind of snap back to reality. Well, that can help. I find I do that at different, like in the shower, I try to be more intentional, like, okay, no, don't have your mind thinking about the rest of the day, like just right here, the water, or now I'm going to do it at dinner when I'm making dinner and just thinking more like, okay, no, I'm making dinner, but to keep bringing yourself back to the present. Um, you had quoted someone in your book saying problems are mind made. And I loved that because that is exactly, you're sitting there with your daughter doing homework. And then your mind all of a sudden is like, what if she always has problems in math and what if she can't balance her checkbook? And <laughs> right, 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 right. And it's so fear-based. And, and again, I think men, I know we talked about this the last time we were together, but you know, men are much better at this on the whole, you know? And so I think we can learn a lot from um, you know, the men in our life, whether it's fathers, brothers, husbands, whoever, but um, just to watch them live in the moment. And sometimes we make fun of it, you know, but it's actually, you know, such a 
a relief. When I first started writing my blog, my 90 year old grandfather started reading it and he was like, ah. Catherine, I totally understand from your point of view, all that's going on up here, but I just don't have that. Yeah. And he said, it makes me want to drink a vodka soda just thinking about what's going on in here. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny yeah I do I do agree with you with the aspect like men not worrying so much maybe about what kids are wearing to school or um that sort of aspect although I am noticing with the coronavirus I am having to coach some men or some you know giving wives some pointers for their husbands because they are future casting like financial gloom and do, like things that they have no idea about yet but they aren't it's like what do you know right here right now what do you need to do and let's take care of that um, because I think they they sort of have this idea they've gotten their ducks in the row and I mean they're having their own challenges of like this is what I was supposed to do and now oh my gosh um, yeah. and I think I think that's why it's helpful mental health for all sexes because <laughs> it's coming into play here now where maybe as women we've taken on the brunt of the worrying for the family <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah a lot of men struggling um, you mentioned a study called a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Do you remember anything about that? Or can you speak a little more? Yeah, about that, was, that was the study that, that revealed that much of the pain and heartache that we bring on from kind of virtual time travel is from the future and not from the past. And that was the study where, um, you know, the, the 85% of the time, it, whatever, because they tracked people, you know, what uh -huh. are you worried about? I'm worried about losing my job. I'm worried about, you know, getting kicked out of school. Like, And they tracked them over time and 85% of the time it didn't come true. Yeah. And, you know, even when it did, you know, somebody wasn't doing well in, in college and, um, but they were suspended for a semester. They weren't kicked out completely. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, this, this wandering mind. And, you know, I think we think as women that we're helping ourselves, you know, I'm going to get ahead of it. I'm going to get ahead of all this. So if I worry yeah. about it, I can fix it. But in the example of me going to the tennis tournament, you know, that didn't help anybody. No. Me yelling at myself. It didn't make me a better tennis player. It didn't make me get there on time. I was still late. Mm -hmm. And so I think we think that worry prepares us and that we're, you know, losers if we're not worried about, you know, so many things in the future, but it doesn't really make anybody better. It doesn't make your daughter a better person. It doesn't make your house cleaner. You know, it's, no. it doesn't serve as much of a purpose as we think that it does. And it's so interesting because I will, I, I think Wayne Dyer says worry is like sitting in a rocking chair, ex rocking in a rocking chair and expecting to go somewhere. You know, like you're just thinking it's doing something, thinking that you worrying about your daughter is going to make her more likely to have the positive result. Or I know um, my grandmother once said, I asked her how her flight was and she said, well, it was, it was like, you know, West Coast, to East Coast. And she said, well, it was long. She said, I just spent the whole time helping the pilot fly, you know, like <laughs> she's sitting back there <laughs> in the passenger seat, like <laughs> using yeah. her mental energy. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought up Wayne Dyer because I am a huge fan of his and I've written many, many blog posts about his, you know, inspiring talks and one of the things that I wrote about and so like a mother that he brings up is that your body, your soul, and even, um, you know, met your, the physical nature of your body does not know that something is hypothetical. And so the way that Wayne Dyer talks about this is think about when you wake up in the middle of the night from a nightmare mm. and your heart is racing and you're sweating because you were just asleep and someone was chasing you through the woods with an ax. Mm -hmm. Now, was someone really chasing you through the woods with an ax? No, but your mind thought that there was. And so your body increases its cortisol rates, increases stress hormones, and it ends up giving you heart disease, you're more prone to cancer, etc. So Wayne's point was your body can't distinguish between hyperbole and the truth. And so when you live in this world of I'm going to lose my job, this is going to be awful, this is going to happen, it does change your body physiologically, you know? Mm -hmm. It's And so I thought that was really interesting because not only is it wasted energy, but it's harmful. 
It's hard though. I, my company is called Strength Mind and Body because I went through an experience where I thought I was really healthy in my body and then ended up having all these physical manifestations of the drama that was in my life. But I was like, oh no, if I keep exercising and eating right, it'll be all okay. But it's not because that internal experience is creating this level of stress and cortisol that is not helpful for us. And I, I, yeah, I definitely credit Wayne Dyer and many other people um, for bringing this to light, that it is, you know, our thoughts do create a, a physical sensation in our body that is not helpful. And the more we can lean into that, it's helpful. It is, you know, this, the coronavirus going on, it is so evident to me. I am, you know, I'm the physical manifestations of the disease for sure. Luckily, I don't have any of that in my immediate house, but we sure do have what I'm calling Corona brain or, you know, the fear of the fear of the virus is sort of like oozing in through the windows. And it's like up to us to sort of control that again. Well, I'm so glad you just said that, Susie, because, you know, it's like, even though I'm a teacher of this stuff, I still forget, you know, it's like, we constantly have to be reminded that the more and more people get diagnosed with coronavirus convinced that like my family was going to get it and I was all stressed out about this morning I'm like fussing everybody to wash their hands you know like none of us can get sick and um but that's me fearing the future like I don't know if any of us are going to get sick and even if we do like can we really prevent it like can we really help you know and so um I don't know but I that's so funny that you just said yeah. that because it just reminded me that I was doing it this morning with the coronavirus. Yeah, it's like right here, right now, what can we do? Wash our hands and then keep our moment here. Okay, we're eating breakfast. And right here, right now, my family doesn't have it. Uh -uh. So that's all I know. Yeah, and then let's not bring that energy in there like Wayne Dyer says and make the fear a part of our physical experience because it's not helpful. So near the end of your book, you talk about three tools that you use, three secret weapons for killing your dragons. Can you feel like sharing any of those secret weapons with the listeners? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. One of them is meditation, you know, which, you know, we talked about that um, just spending time in the silence and listening to what your soul has to say. I always like to say, you know, we need to get our mind to shut up so that we can listen to what our soul has to say. So that's, you know, really important. Um, Self-compassion is a huge tool in our arsenal. Like I said earlier, to give yourself a break when you make a mistake. I think it's really the greatest tool yeah. that we're never going to be mistake free. We're never going to get through this life, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, without our hiccups and, you know, mishaps. And so if you can love yourself through the, the hard stuff and that, you know, what I want women to know is something like self-compassion, you already possess the ability to be kind to yourself. You do. It's not something you have to go buy or go train, you know, to be an Olympic athlete to accomplish. Um, you do have the tools and resources. It just takes practice. Well, can I just and share real quick? Because what you just said happened this morning for you in your house is sort of fear of the coronavirus and washing the hands. You just approached that with self-compassion to yourself. You weren't like, oh my God, look at that. I'm such an idiot. I brought it into my, you were like, oh wow. Look at like, but more like curious observer. Oh, that's interesting. Now that I know better, I'll do it differently. Yeah. And again, and that goes back to just awareness being so much of the battle, like hearing you say that made me aware that I was doing it, but I'm okay that I did it. You know, like you yeah, said, you approached it from a nice place. Yeah. It's not, you know, annihilating yourself. And then another like tool in the arsenal that I talk about towards the end of the book is honesty. Mm -hmm. And saying when you're having a hard time and saying when you're struggling and you know, we put these perfect personas out on social media and around our mother-in-law, you know, we're all perfect and, you know, proper, but I have found the more honest you are about your struggles, the more help and support you will get, but also more often than not, you're going to be met on the receiving end with, oh, me too. Mm -hmm. So when you think you're the only one struggling, you know, with your kids at home, if you open up and you talk about it, you'll hear all your friends' struggles, you know, it'll just start to be you know the a snowball effect of honesty and you know we just can't continue to live this double life where we're hollow and empty and exhausted on the inside and on the outside we're happy and perfect and 
you know, skipping through wheat fields. And so honesty is really well, yeah, I, I love that. And that's what I really love about your book too, is that, and that's what I speak about in the other podcast, but just to touch on here is that how, when you, you studied and polled and researched all these women, they said self-doubt was their main thing. And I think that's because so many of us are portraying these like, oh, it's all perfect here. Look, away. you know, but the more now with this changing tide that we can say, oh yeah, hold on. Like there are struggles here. We don't need to suffer, but yes, there are struggles and we can come together. I guarantee the next time someone is in the gym and they like stretch their back and they have that negative thought, like, oh, look at my, you know, heavy thighs. They're gonna be like, oh, but wait, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's hearing, oh, but Catherine had this thought too. And this is okay. This is all right. We have beautiful woman bodies and this is, you know, all this, it's sharing our experience and knowing that we're not alone and that it's not this perfect Facebook feed by any means really helpful. Yeah. I like that honest piece. Um, as yeah, well. it's important. You know, people who are not honest don't get the help and the support they need. And when I wrote Slay Like a Mother and my, my husband read it, he was like, geez, are you sure other women feel this way? I mean, you know, it's because I had never been honest about my insecurities and my self-doubt and I put on a brave face yeah. through a lot of times. And, um, and I was like, oh no, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> Oh, and, yeah. uh, but it, it's not, you know, I think it's time for this kind of national release valve, you know, to say yeah. it's all been too much. And, um, and that's why I felt so strongly about writing this book is I went through years of therapy, read so many health, self-help books, watched every Oprah episode, and I really healed myself and I learned to love myself and I could have stopped there, you know, and just moved yeah. on with my life, but I felt so strongly about the tools and the resources that I collected along the way and how much they truly changed my life that I felt obligated in a way to write this book because it felt so selfish keeping these secrets to myself because I've seen the, the healing power of them. Yeah. Well, I am very grateful. I am incredibly, and it's now in paperback. So there is, I want everyone to head to as that's the paperback there. I still have the hardcover, but I'm, everyone can go to Amazon. I will have a link as to where to get it because it truly is a tool. And to wrap up, we, this show is called the love your life show, where there's certain things that you do every morning or day to set yourself up for success, to love your life. I, um, I try to exercise in the morning and I'll do um, 30 minutes of exercise. And I'm finally good about not feeling like I have to do more. I felt like for a long time, like if I don't work out for an hour, it's not good enough, you know. Yeah. And, um, but I'm now doing it every day for 30 minutes. And then I'll do um, like a 10 minute meditation, very short, you know, after. But it's just a way to ground my day, especially now that the day seems so much longer because we're it's all like 10 home. years long. I know. <laughs> And, um, and so, you know, now I feel like I have less of an excuse not to make time for something like that, but it's important for me to do it in the morning. I'll never do it at night because I like happy hour too much. Yeah. Um, and so I do it in the morning and it just is kind of a way to calm, you know, my mind. Ground you and your mental health. And then I guess finding your moments during the day to remember, mind yourself, to bring yourself back to the moment and bring yourself back to the day. Yeah, well, absolutely. Thank you very much, Catherine, for being on the show. We love um, hearing you and your message and are grateful that you are shouting this from the mountaintops because we all need to slay our dragons of self-doubt. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Susie. I really appreciate it. Thank you.